Good morning, everybody. Somebody's mic is falling here. Thank you for coming. I apologize for not being able to do this last night. The quicker I, I'd like to get this thing settled as quickly as I can. Let me uh, tell you a couple things. First of all, apparently there's going to be a vote on the ABM treaty at 9.30 or thereabouts. And then I'm uh, going to begin the Bork hearings at 10 o'clock. And I'm here uh, for two reasons. One, to set the, set the record straight, and two, to uh, get on with my business as chair of the Judiciary Committee. Several matters have been raised with regard to my presidential campaign and the conduct of it, and about my, uh, my freshman year in law school 23 years ago. And I want to answer uh, all your questions about those matters to the best of my ability. I hope, if we haven't, my staff has for you my entire transcript from law school, from undergraduate school, everything that you would ever want to know about what a brilliant student I was in undergraduate school and graduate school. <laughs> and uh, the only bad part about all this is my sons are going to find out I didn't do as well as they thought I did. The, uh, let me start off and uh, speak to, uh, very briefly, I have no prepared statement, but very briefly to the three matters that I have been brought to my attention and I should elaborate on for you. The first is the matter of whether or not in a, uh, in a California speech a year and a half ago or whenever it was, a year ago, that I uh, quoted Robert Kennedy without uh, attributing it to Robert Kennedy. The fact of the matter is that uh, most of you know, or many of you know, I write my own speeches. This speech I did not write. I honestly thought the paragraph that was referred to as uh, was a piece of brilliant work by my staff, just as the lines that they have come up with, I would say the more original lines in any campaign of just uh, the broken hearts line and others when they, uh, and, the, and the quote related to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I later learned it was a quote, uh, related to um, uh, that all these things do not measure the, the sanctity of our marriages, etc. I did not know that was a Robert Kennedy quote. My mistake. I'm a great fan of Robert Kennedy's. I should have known it was Robert Kennedy's quote. I did not know that. But it's nonetheless my mistake, uh, number one. Number two, um, I, it's been raised that, uh, by uh, my opposition that uh, I uh, have uh, used a um, I have uh, uh, paraphrased uh, Neil Kinnock, and it's true I have, uh, and I will continue to, because the sentiment he expresses is a sentiment that, in fact, I think best expresses what, uh, what's at stake here about building a platform for people. The, uh, I made no mistake, in my view, in using the Kinnock quote, and on all but one occasion, to the best of my knowledge, I attributed it directly to Kinnock, or I even went and told the whole story about Kinnock about how I had this tape, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Uh, at the Iowa debate, at the end of the debate, I did not do what I did in fl at the Florida JJ dinner the week before there, or whenever it was nearby, or last week at the Jefferson Jackson Day dinner in Pennsylvania. I did not say, to paraphrase Neil Kinnock. I should have, but I was talking about me in there, and I was applying the same exact thing Kinnock said about himself to me, which applied as I said it. Now, there is one thing that I did not, that, that I think was a, uh, a matter of my, uh, my extra exuberance. And uh, I have been making speeches on foreign policy because, quite frankly, I think I'm the most qualified person in the Democratic Party to speak to that issue. And as a part of that process and the stump speech I've been making, I talk about how I have traveled around the world, which I have, and I have met the leaders from Deng Xiaoping to Sadat who's obviously passed away, to Helmut Schmidt, who's no longer there, to Margaret Thatcher, who's still a leader. And in the context of one of my speeches, I then went into a, a comment about, uh, and I said, and then we must build a platform. And uh, I implied clearly, from what I'm told on the tape, I clearly implied, if not said, that a man who is an acquaintance of mine, who I've known for years, Dennis Healy, who's on the tape, sent me the tape. Dennis Healy did not send me the tape. The tape was given to me and apparently several other presidential candidates uh, by a, uh, 
uh, by someone who had just been to England covering the English elections. I did not. That was totally inadvertent. Dennis, Dennis Healy, I do consider a good acquaintance. Dennis Healy, I have great respect for. But Dennis Healy did not send me the tape. What I had been saying in all of it, I said, and I assume one of the reasons why this is so pertinent to me is because Dennis Healy is in this tape. And he, he talks about Kinnock as being a, in the tape, if you've seen it, uh, the tape I'm referring to, but you all know what I'm talking about? The tape I'm referring to is a 10-minute advertisement done by the Labor Party at the end of the last election. That's the tape I'm referring to. A 10-minute uh, made by the, apparently the gentleman who did Chariots of Fire uh, was, the, was the person who produced it. And, uh, and quite frankly, I think there's, uh, you'll all be the judge and the people will be the judge. I think there's much to do about nothing. I noticed that uh, when I, when I, um, stand up. I watched two of my presidential contenders uh, stand there and say uh, what all of you have heard me say, first and I think only, that we have a chance to bend history. If you go back and look at the announcement speeches of other candidates, you'll see they said bend history. Have you ever heard anybody say that but me? I'm not running around saying they shouldn't say they can bend history. They can bend history if they want to bend history. In the marketplace of ideas in the political realm, the notion that every thought or notion or idea you'd have to go back and find and attribute to someone, I think is, quite frankly, uh, ludicrous. And if you look at the themes that I've been pushing and some of you have been covering me, I think you'll find that there are, there are uh, uh, echoes of those themes in other campaigns, which there should be. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, now to the tough part, as far as I'm concerned, my record in law school. I made a mistake. When I got to law school, and you will give, be given the entire record, I did not have this record. I had sent away to Syracuse for the record. They had sent me the record, but they did not send me the material that's the most pertinent, not because they kept it from me. It was on my record. I had, there's a, there's a course called Legal Methods. And it's the course, some of you are lawyers. Every freshman in law school, at least at Syracuse, has to write a legal memoranda the first six weeks they're at school. And the purpose, I believe, if I recall correctly from 23 years ago, is in fact to teach you how to use the library and to write a legal brief. And what you do is you have, you're divided into groups, and there were a hundred and, I don't know, 30 people started off in my class. We ended up graduating, I think, 86 or 87. I graduated 76 out of that bunch. Um, uh, the, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, um, we started off and they divided us into groups. And what they did is, what you would do is, I would check your paper, you would check my paper, and she would check your paper. And part of the mark was also the ability to critique and show you could really rip apart the other person's paper. I hope I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> I'll wait if you, if you need that. The stills, the stills are dead? Well, I'll jump up and down that or something. The, um, uh, and uh, so I, I wrote a paper. And what I did through that paper, I went and got a, a law review article. The law review article had within the law review article a number of citations and cases. I took the cases out of the law review article and the footnotes out of the law review article, and I thought what I was doing honestly was the right way to do it, and the, and the representation about what the case said from the law review article. And then at the end, of the Law Review article when they set out and said, this is what all this means. I wrote that in my paper, what the conclusion of the Law Review article, and I footnoted it. Now, folks, the footnote, I'm footnoting a Law Review article on a 15-page paper where I use five pages of the 15 pages out of the Law Review, which refer to the cases. And then as the conclusion comes up, I cite the conclusion, footnote 21, Law Review article, what page it occurs at at the end of these, th this citation. I was wrong, but I was not malevolent in any way. And so this young fellow who apparently somebody's found, some other campaigns found, <laughs> great, I knew he'll already be around somewhere one day, uh, um, found and uh, he went as a, uh, as a good young fellow and he said, hey professor, this guy didn't do it the right way. Brought it to the Professor, the professor brought it to the dean. The dean said, explain yourself, Biden. And I wrote, which you will get, it's in my record here. I wrote a two-page letter explaining 
why I had been so stupid, but that I did not intentionally move to mislead anybody. And I didn't. To this day, I didn't. I know I didn't. I did not. I was mistaken, but I was not in any way malevolent. So I asked in the bottom of the letter, I said, Dean, let me speak to the whole faculty and make my case. In a sense, my first trial. And I walked in and I made my case. The dean told me afterwards, later that afternoon, that in fact what they were going to do was make me take an F in the course for this semester if I made it through the remainder of the school year and were still in good standing the second year, not related to anything ethical or unethical, just made it through in terms of my grades, because they told us when we got there they're going to flunk 40 of us out. If I made it through, then I'd have to repeat the course, the legal writing course. And I'd repeat that course the next fall, and whatever grade I got in that course would be my grade, and they'd strike the F from my transcript. You have my, you'll have my transcript also. And you'll see a line from the official transcript. Through that, I went from an F to a B. I often think what would happen if I hadn't gotten that B, I would have been 78 in my class. But at any rate, now, that's the whole of it. That's it. What you have, what I'll give you, and then the dean wrote a letter. The dean who presided over the matter wrote a memorandum of the file that I'd never seen till yesterday, which said, let me quote the letter. But you, I mean, you'll all, I'm sure you'll all go through it very closely anyway, as you should. I'm not being facetious. You should. It says, the faculty, it says, Syracuse University College of Law, December 1, 1965. Hard to believe it's 23 years ago. Um, almost 23. Jo uh, two, or it says subject, Biden, Joseph R., memorandum it has written up here. It says, quote, the faculty in a meeting on December 1st, 1965, found that in his required paper in a course on legal methods, Mr. Biden used five pages of published law review articles, of a published law review article without quotation or citation. That's precisely right. The five pages worth I did not cite. The sixth page I did cite where they had the conclusion. And then he says that um, the faculty rec recommended to the dean that his grade in the course be recorded as F, and that this minute be added to his file, and that if he continues in the law school next year, he'll take the course again, or be precise, make this a required course of, excuse me. If he continues in the law school next year, he must take the required course in legal methods. In conference with Mr. Biden the same day, the dean explained the action of the faculty and the fact that Mr. Biden would have to consider the probable outcome of his application to a character committee to certify for his fitness to practice law. The dean informed Mr. Biden that if his record in the law school was clear from this point on, the dean would be willing to state to his character committee his opinion that this matter should not stand in the way of his admission. Then upon graduation, the dean who succeeded the deceased dean, that was Dean Karras, Dean Miller, wrote to the Bar Committee in Delaware. Dear Mr. Canby, Joseph R. Biden, Jr. was awarded a J.D. degree from this college on, of law on June 2nd, 1968. He was, a regu he was in regular attendance, <laughs> not always, uh, while pursuing his studies of law at Syracuse University. Mr. Biden is a gentleman of high moral character. His record reflects nothing whatsoever of a derogatory nature and there is nothing to indicate the slightest question about his integrity, industry, or ability. August 1st, 1968, 20 years ago. So ladies and gentlemen, I made a mistake. Little did I know I'd be standing before the whole world acknowledging the fact that I didn't know how to write a legal memorandum and it pay costing me as much as it's costing me. But I've learned one thing since I've decided to run for president, and I assume one thing, everything about me. Everything about me is going to come out in the public record. And I've done some dumb things, and I'll do dumb things again. I've done some dumb things as a senator, I've done some dumb things as, as a lawyer. But what I haven't done, and I suggest to you, is a matter of my character. Go ask anyone with whom I ever practiced law, opponent or friend. Ask any of my colleagues, anyone, opponent or friend. Ask anyone whatever whom I've had a relationship with. And if they tell you Joe Biden is not as straight as an arrow, I'll be very surprised. So ladies and gentlemen, I've been dumb. I did something very stupid 23 years ago. That's it. Uh, fire away.
Biden, yes. The questions have arisen about what you've done more recently than 23 years ago. You say that were all those uh, references to Hubert Humphrey's speeches, to Robert Kennedy's speeches, to John Kennedy's speeches, were all those inadvertent references put in by speechwriters or by Joe Biden? I don't know what all you're talking about. The one I know about, for example, I have, and everyone else, there are certain generic quotes people have used um, about, uh, uh, matter of fact, I got a call from, uh, from a guy who's a friend of mine. I think none of you believe it, but uh, Jesse Jackson. And Jesse called me to tell me, he said, look, Joe, I used the Hubert Humphrey quote about the dawn of life, the uh, whatever, and he said, I didn't attribute it and I didn't, I didn't know it. The fact of the matter is every time that I have been aware that it has been someone else's quote, I have used it. As a matter of fact, the criticism of me by the press with good reason has been in part in this campaign that I quote too many people, that I quote Kennedy all the time, I quote King all the time, I quote uh, Humphrey all the time. So what I'm saying to you is that if and when I've ever quoted anyone without saying this is their quote, it's either because, as I say in some speeches, listen, can you hear the voices? Let the word go forth. I don't quote anybody, everybody knows that. When I haven't attributed it, it's either because, in fact, it's been clearly known by everyone what it is, or I honestly did not know I was quoting somebody else. And I want to say one other thing. It's ironic to me, and I, I guess it's, you know, it all comes to the territory. But I don't know anybody else other than Reverend Jackson who's had as much original material uh, as I have had in my speeches. And the irony is I'm standing here um, talking about whether or not um, uh, my use of someone else's quotes uh, um, are, uh, are, are, are the essence of uh, who I am and what I say and what I stand for. As honest as I can answer your question. Senator, what effect do you think this might have on your presidential campaign? I don't think it will have any effect, but I don't know. You all will make the judgment about that. It will all depend on how you write it. I don't mean that. I'm not being smart. It will all depend on the American people looking at me. They're going to look at me and say, is Joe Biden being honest with me? Or is Joe Biden not being honest with me? I'm being honest. And if they conclude that, uh, that uh, my, uh, my mistakes uh, and my attitude, in addition to, ab about uh, these other two matters, the quotes and the rest, is not right, then, well, they have a right to say, not me. But Senator, find out that the Kinnick material. Um, yes. Before the Iowa debate, did you sit with that videotape and learn his gestures and memorize the words. And could you explain why, at the beginning of that close, you said that you had been thinking about what you wanted to say? I sure can. I'm, thank you for asking me. The answer is yes. I looked at that tape. I was moved by that tape. Uh, I, we sat down. I turned it on. I said, my Lord, look at this guy. Look at the, what he is expressing here. And I, didn't, I looked at it once, and I didn't have to look at it again. And what I would do out on the, out on the stump, I'd say, I saw a tape from Neil Kinnock where he stands there and he's angry. And he looks out at his people and he says, why am I the first Kinnock ever to go to a university? It doesn't take much if you feel that, folks. You don't have to look at that 10 times. I saw that and it was a connect. I mean, I could tell how that man felt. And it's how I feel. It's how I feel about what my party's about and what I'm about. Why in the Lord's name am I standing up here as a presidential candidate at 44 years old? Because I'm so much better than my, for the rest of, I honestly think it connected with me. My father's a smarter, smarter than I am. So is my mother. Why me? Because they gave me a shot. And that's the notion I was trying to communicate to people. And I used Kenick to communicate it. Now, what I did in the speech, I landed at the airport. I know you all know that I don't spend a lot of time, um, uh, I don't spend a lot of time writing um, speeches. I do them on the back of envelopes. I do them, I mean, I work on them, but I do them. Some of you travel with me and you watch how I do them. And on the way out to fly out for that debate, which I had to do something the day before, and I'm going out to the debate out in, uh, they call it the, the joint appearance. And uh, I didn't have a close. And I must tell you, it's, as you've observed, it's hard for me to say anything in two minutes. And 
I, uh, I didn't have a clothes. And I got off the plane, and I feel, by the way, that I know the subject matter of these debates. I don't feel like I've got, I've been here 15 years. So all I was trying to think of, what do I close with? How do I, how do I close? And usually what I do, as you've observed, is I wait till the debate goes on and sees where the debate takes us. So to make an appropriate close, not some canned thing. And so I'm getting in the car and there's a young man named David Wilhelm who runs my campaign. And I said, David, I don't have a close. And they said, we prepared you seven or eight closes. And I said, I don't agree with any of them. They don't have any feeling to them. He said, well, why don't you do what you do on the Kenick thing? That expresses what you mean. And I said, you're right. And I said, you know, thinking about it, that applies to me. And that's honest to God true. What happened? We're riding over in the van. And I, I, I mean, I said that to, I said to him, that's it. I, was he in the van with me? I think he was. And, um, and so I got there. And what I should have said instead of saying what I was, I was thinking about it on the way over. What I should have said, I should have said, to paraphrase Neil Kinnock, it's the only time I didn't in all the times I've ever used it. Those same people heard me give this quote. I mean, that audience was made up of people who've heard all of us. They were all everybody's people. At any rate, that's it. California were Kennedy's remarks? I don't know. I don't remember, but if you notice, I, uh, um, after that, I think there were several times after that, I used it and attributed to either a uh, famous person or uh, um, uh, uh, I, 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 to tell you the truth, Nathan, I honest to God don't know. My recollection is in April, when I was traveling with you, you were using those remarks unattributed. Yeah, and I'm telling you, I don't remember when I found that out. Dennis Healy. Um, my recollection, again, I'm not in Wilmington, don't have my material, that a number of times in New Hampshire you attributed getting the tape from Healy on more than one occasion in some detail. I just acknowledge that to you. I was referring to the one occasion that was out there. I believe what I did throughout this thing is I would mix and move and I was talking about how, how I, I clearly, if I didn't say it, I clearly implied I got it from Healy. Have, though, based on those two things, is, do you feel you're able to control, to put in the vernacular of your mouth, that you can think before you talk? Well, I've been in this business for 15 years. Um, and uh, I, uh, um, I let my record of 15 years versus the transgression that you're referring to uh, stand. And you, can make, you all can make that judgment. I feel very capable of uh, using my mouth in sync with my mind. Senator, Senator, Senator. I, in relation to your law, the law school incident, yep. the memo from the dean say the December 1st of your freshman year, when yep. was the, the paper oh, yeah, that I'll give you a written? paper was actually written and handed in October the 18th. And when did school start, sir? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, September. I mean, it was like six weeks into school. Uh, I, I honestly, but you, you have, I'll give you every one of the, including the paper. I mean, a paper that's marked up, the whole works. I didn't know they had the paper. I, I'm serious. I'm not being smart. I, I didn't know that. I didn't think they, anyway. Senator, you think that, that this issue has been raised by your opponents? Well, uh, do you think that, uh, that the other campaigns told. are out to get you for some reason? Or is I, 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 don't, I don't have any opinion. Well, the reason I mention that is I was, I was told by a, it was in print in the Wilmington newspaper where one, campaign was asked whether or not they did this, and they said no, another campaign did this. And there was a reference, I'm told, in a Des Moines paper saying that one of the campaigns did this. Look, I'm a big boy. I, I've been in politics for 15 years. This is not my style. Uh, if they want to do it this way, so be it. But it's not my style. I am not very good. Um, at, I don't know. You all will find that out, I'm confident. Senator, a lot of Democratic leaders are saying that the real question is, in this is, is not whether you borrowed some text, textual material, but whether your vision, which is supposedly one of your strong points, is real or whether it's borrowed. And, and they cite not only these examples, but the fact that you seek often to identify yourselves with the Kennedys and Martin Luther King and the activism of the 60s, 
even though your record is somewhat at odds with that, that you were not greatly involved in civil rights, you were for the war, and you even thought of running for office as a Republican. Do you, do you, how do you answer those people? No, well, first of all, I, we've talked about this a lot, you and I. That's not, I that, that, that's not accurate, by the way. I mean, that's kind of a, anyway, let me answer the, uh, answer the question. I don't know anybody who has run for public office who has tried to communicate a great idea, who hasn't gone back and used other great ideas to make those motions. I mean, I recall Robert Kennedy quoting, he, he did not think up, if I recall, the notion that some men ask, you know? That wasn't his, but it conveyed what he meant. It didn't mean he associated himself. When I quote Edmund Burke in these hearings, I don't, I'm not quoting Edmund Burke because I agree with his conservative views, but because the point he's making allows me to communicate in eloquent language, the point that I want to make on that specific instance, number one. So, I mean, I don't, I don't quite understand this. <laughs> but second point I'd like to make is that, um, that with regard to my almost running as a Republican, that is not correct. What is correct is that when I got back from law school, my Democratic Party in the state of Delaware had less than an enlightened view on race. The race issue meant a lot to me. I could not bring myself to register as a Democrat. And you used to be 20, you had to be 21 back in those days went to register. And so I came back to Delaware and I registered as a decline, independent, because I couldn't bring myself to associate with Richard Nixon and what he, I don't mean, I didn't mean in a personal sense, but what he stood for, his, the, that, the, that philosophy. And I wasn't comfortable with, a, with the Democratic Party, which at that time was more an old Southern Democratic Party. And so I registered independent. In the meantime, I worked for a law firm, clerked for a law firm that was a, 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 a mainstream blue blood Republican law firm. And they tried to get me to join the Young Republicans. One day I'm sitting there and they asked me to, the junior, they always had the Young Republicans party at their office, Christmas party. And I'm a low man in the totem pole, so I had to go out and get the stuff for the party, for the senior partner. And the next thing you know, they asked me whether that I'd consider getting involved in hold office in the Young Republicans. I said, I'm not a Republican. I don't want to be a Republican. And an, uh, another instance that happened is a uh, friends of mine came to me and said, Bill Roth is not going to run. He was my next door neighbor. I said, he's going to run for the Senate. Why don't you run for the Congress as a Republican? I said, I don't want to run for Congress as a Republican. I don't want to run for Congress. And so that's, you know, this stuff about I was a Republican. Now, lastly, with regard to the 60s. During the 60s, I was, in fact, very concerned about the civil rights movement. I was not an activist. I worked at an all-black swimming pool in the east side of Wilmington, Delaware. I was involved. I was involved in what, what they were thinking, what they were feeling. I was involved, but I was not out marching. I was not down in Selma. I was not anywhere else. I was a suburbanite kid who got a dose of exposure to what was happening to black Americans when I, in my own city, Worked there, one of the only white employee as the only white lifeguard in this the 13 or 14 lifeguards to find out that many of these guys lived in that city their whole life, a small city, and never knew a white man. It was a revelation to me. And it, uh, it appalled me. And I, look, I was 29 when I ran for the Senate, folks. While other people were marching, carrying banners, I was down here voting against the war. I came down here at 29 years old. So, you know, well, the war was still on. So this notion that I wasn't involved, that I supported the war, you know, I mean, I was not out. I am not, as you probably all figured out about me. I don't like dirty campaigns. I am not culturally one of those guys who likes to, uh, I don't fit very well with, I'm not a joiner. I don't go out, I'm not very, I, I was out of sync with. By the time the war movement was at its peak, when I was at Syracuse, I was married. I was in law school. I wore sport coats. I was not part of that. I'm serious. What you all don't seem to understand, is, is some of you, I think you understand it. I don't think you're really being, well, I won't characterize it. But, you know, there was a four-year period there, folks. There's light, there's a, a, a light years. When I was on the college campus, those of you who go back with me, 1961 to 65, Vietnam was like Nicaragua is now. We all said that's kind of stupid, but it's going to end. But you don't see many people marching on campuses. 
Go up to my son's campus in Philadelphia, or go down south, or go out west. It's nothing like the anti-war movement. That's about where Vietnam was in 1963, in 64, and 65. So I find you all going back and saying, well, where were you, Senator Biden, at the time? You know, I think it's bizarre. I think it's bizarre. And then when the movement did catch up, I was a 23-year-old guy, married. And look, you're looking at a middle-class guy. I am who I am. I'm not big on flak jackets and tie-dye shirts and, you know, that's not me. I'm serious. But that's the period. So anyway, I want to get this straight, man, because I keep getting asked this all the time. And I'm not going to get this many in your room again until I'm inaugurated. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> the, the, the second thing is, when I got finished, when I got finished law school, I came back. I had the most important thing to me in my life is my family. And I got back and I was going to have a baby. Flat out. That's what was important to me. And I was going to take the bar exam, which was a bear. You know, I mean, I hated law school. <laughs> I really did. But by the way, go out and ask anybody in Delaware whether you think I was not a good lawyer and ask any client I represented whether they think they didn't get their money's worth and ask anybody in Delaware that ever watched me try a case to tell me that I wasn't a good trial lawyer. Go find anybody. I was a good lawyer. I am a good lawyer. If you want to find out more about that, come down at 10 o'clock, down at the hearing. So, you know, folks, I don't understand this. And how many other people, 29 years old, did something about the war? I'm the guy who asked the Foreign Relations Committee, when Gerald Ford said he had a plan to end it, I remember, and some of you will remember, I looked at, at uh, um, Senator Mansfield. I said, why don't we ask to go see the president and ask him what the plan is? I said, well, no one ever does that. And I said, well, why not? And I remember Jack Javits standing there and saying, well, it's not a bad idea. Let me call Henry. They called Henry Kissinger. And we all went down, I think, if not the first time, one of the few times in history that the entire Foreign Relations Committee went down and sat with the President and with the Secretary of State. And everybody played patty cakes. Everybody went down and said, yes, Mr. President, no, Mr. President. And they were very polite. And I was young. I was 30, I guess, then. And I'll never forget, and you asked some of my colleagues who were there, I said, and I remember being scared to death saying it, I said, I'm begging the President's pardon, Mr. President, but if the President were the Senator from Delaware, I expect the President would expect me to ask the President this question. I was a fool. I mean, I was so nervous asking the question. But I said, Mr. President, what is the plan? With all due respect, I've heard this all my career. What is the plan? I did more in that meeting than a lot of people did that marched. So I don't take a back seat to the notion that somehow I did not go on the line. Other people marched. I ran for office, got elected to the United States Senate at 29 and came down here and was one of those votes to help stop the war. And I'm proud of it. Senator, hasn't, this, hasn't this issue undermined your credibility on Judiciary Committee during the board hearings? I think what you should do is you should ask any of my colleagues Ask any of my colleagues, Democrat or Republican, whether they think it's undermined my ability to do the Bork hearing. I invite you to do that. I will not characterize it. Anyone, from Senator Humphrey to Senator Thurman, Senator Simpson. Call up Simpson, ask him. Call up Thurman, ask him what he said to me yesterday. Senator Look, this place runs on honor. This place runs on honor if it's going to work. And yesterday, when this thing, when I got this record, I called all of my colleagues and I said, will you give me a matter of personal privilege? I want to explain to you something. I talked about my record. I sat them all in there. It's not an easy thing to do, folks. I, something I have to do. It wasn't a hard thing, but it wasn't easy either. You ask them what they think. You ask them what they spontaneously said to me. So I don't think it undermines. The only thing that will undermine my ability to run the board hearings is if it turns out I don't know what I'm talking about on the issues. Yes. Much of what is being discussed in the Bork hearings are Bork's statements and writings of 20 years ago. Does this incident give you a new perspective on that? No. I, you know, I know about Look, folks, I assumed all along this was going to come out. New York Times asked for our records. I'm going to give them all my records. I called to get them. You know, you, you all would not look and say, gee, he's got an F with a line slashed through it and then a B above it. I wonder why. I guess we don't, I'm not going to ask anymore about that. 
The answer is no. What the Bork hearing is about is about principles. Bork, I find to be an honorable man. If you listen to my questioning to Bork, I've asked Bork about matters of principle upon which we disagree. I think we disagree. And, you know, I mean, anyway, yeah, yes, Mr. Bode. Senator, do you, at the timing of particularly the Syracuse matter, has led some to suspect that perhaps Republican opponents have uh, been at work getting, digging out your records. Do you have any suspicion along those lines? I don't know whether my Republican opponents or Democratic opponents. All I know is that it is somewhat coincidental that you all have been writing that Biden's first primary is the Bork nomination. I know every one of my opponents in one form or another have been saying, geez, I'm not sure I want Bork to win, but I'm not sure I want Biden to do well either. They've got a dilemma. It's a conundrum. You know, I mean, they've got a problem. And so everybody, I think that it is not purely coincidental that on the day, I want to tell you, Ken, it's somewhat unsettling to see you on the air. I didn't say you did anything wrong with me, but the day before my hearing, a guy who values honor above everything else saying, whoa, look at this. I make the top of the news. Isn't that interesting? And I went around and spoke to almost all your editorial boards, made my case on the merits, and I find in one of the major magazines, which is appropriate, you did the right thing. I got the, my comments on Bork, which you're all basically saying, hey, the guy's doing pretty well. I'm, I'm being presumptuous. But I think, let me put it this way, people aren't saying, you all sort of wrote beforehand that I was somehow going to leap over, you know, uh, the stage and grab him by the jugular or something. I, you know, I mean, that's the, you, I think, was your expect you in an editorial sense. So right in the middle of this, I get this big box about Biden and Kennick. I don't think it's coincidental, but I tell you one thing. My learning curve is moving on this presidential race, and I want to tell them all, I'm in this race to stay, I'm in this race to win, and here I come. Thanks a lot, folks.